I don't know that there's some grand lesson that people need to take about blackness from Black Panther. I think instead they need to understand that uh, an all-black cast can carry a movie and uh, is worth Hollywood investing more in. Obviously, I want to talk about Black Panther. Sure. So you saw it? I did. You loved it? I loved it. One of the things I love about the movie is the women, mm -hmm. which clearly Ryan loves black women. Yes, he does. Uh, he said how his mother and the woman's life had played a huge influence in how he created those characters and how they were represented on screen. But I think it's especially important that we're seeing black women represented like this, because mm -hmm. I don't think we get to see that ever. Oh, I, just, I thought it just thought it was an interesting choice, and I thought it was a great choice that the women were self-actualized and they were as much a part of the action as Black Panther. And so they weren't sidekicks, they weren't just arm dressing. And still, there was a love story, which I think I enjoy a love story. I enjoy romantic comedies, and uh, this is not a romantic comedy, but I thought that the romance between Black Panther and Nakia was really well done and she was allowed to have her own ambitions, which is so rare. Oftentimes a woman puts her ambitions aside because of love, and here she got to have both, and he made that possible. And um, so, I mean, we can critique that if we really want to, but we can. I Good. would not rather. <laughs> I, I just enjoyed it. It was what it was. I would heard that there was actually scenes shot where you would have seen more of a, a love story between some of the Dora Milaje. Yes. Which obviously you wrote about in World of Wakanda. It was yes. very central to that story because mm -hmm. two of the characters were in the Dora Milaje and they were partners. Yes. Um, so knowing that, did you hear actually that that existed, that scene? Yes. Okay. Um, how did you feel about that not making it to the screen? I thought it was frustrating and same shit, different day. Oftentimes, you know, when we're making progress, people tell queer people or other marginalized people wait. Like, let's make this progress first and have this big black movie, and then we'll get to talking about black queerness. And I thought it was an unfortunate decision because, you know, it was done because it's a Disney movie, and yet there were there was a murder. I mean, kill my, well, it. if you haven't seen the movie at this point, that's your yeah, problem. spoilers. Yeah, <laughs> Killmonger, when he murders his girlfriend, point blank, like, that's fine, but we can't show two women in a, in a relationship that, like, let's think about that, that death is more palatable to the American um, culture than uh, lesbianism. I think that's uh, interesting yeah. and f***ed up. I saw how a lot of people, there's been a lot of pieces online where people are talking about um, Killmonger as a villain and how he does make some very good points that they're indisputable and it's like, how can you not see where he's coming from? Mm -hmm. But I think in the moments where he does something like kill his girlfriend, it's like, this is still a bad guy. He's like, a very bad guy. Yeah. I mean, he murdered hundreds of people and I do think he had some amazing points, but most villains have good points. Most villains are actually in some way critiquing the status quo and certainly he is critiquing the status quo and doing so quite eloquently and I feel a lot of empathy for the little boy that lost his father and was left alone in America while knowing that Wakanda existed and that his birthright had been taken from him. He has every right to be angry. But it's what he did with that anger that I think we can critique. And we can also look at the fact that the decisions he made were very much grounded in the same kinds of imperialism and colonialism that he was trying to eradicate. His solution was, let's send weapons out and just start more wars, as if war has ever solved anything. And so, uh, there's a lot to critique where Killmonger is concerned. Yeah, I think it gets hard for people because he looks like Michael B. Jordan. Yes, he does. <laughs> and, mm. That movie is like one giant thirst trap uh, after another. So. It really is, but I'm in love with M'Baku. Like, goddamn. Yeah. Like, make, I was like, on Twitter, make me a carrot. I know, I saw, I saw <laughs> you tweet. If he's a vegetarian, let me be the carrot. He is so fine. And he fills up a doorway, just like, throw me against the wall. But I think that's also another example of, you know, you're seeing different aesthetics. You're seeing not just different skin colors mm -hmm. where 
you're seeing multiple black people that they don't all look like each other and mm -hmm. they don't all have the same skin tone, but then you're also seeing different body types. You're seeing natural hair in different stages. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is probably one of the first times I can think of in modern pop culture where beauty is so multifaceted and yes. multiple people are beautiful in multiple ways. Absolutely. I think one of the really great things that Kugler did in Black Panther was show um, just really diversity within a diverse group, which is so important because oftentimes when we talk about people of color and marginalized groups, we act like we're all the same and all Asian people are the same. And we don't even understand that Asian means a lot of different things. And it could be Korean, Filipino, uh, Malaysian, Chinese, Japanese, and uh, e that even within those groups, there's diversity. And so to see this kind of diversity in one country, in Wakanda, with the five different tribes and everyone looking different, I thought was just really well done. So for a lot of people, um, a lot of non people of color, this is probably gonna be their biggest or most experience with multiple heritage or multiple um, ethnicities within black culture mm -hmm. because they probably don't live in areas where people don't look just like them. Um, how, what would your hope be for people to take away from this that are not part of a black community? Oh God, I don't know. I mean, I think that I think that people are putting too much responsibility on the movie. I think it's just a movie. I mean, it, it's it's not just a movie, but it's also just a movie. I don't know that there's some grand lesson that people need to take about blackness from Black Panther. I think instead they need to understand that uh, an all-black cast can carry a movie and uh, is worth Hollywood investing more in. Um, I think it's unfair to put the burden of there being sort of more of a moral imperative on the movie. Um, I think it's unfair because we don't ask that of anyone else. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I, I was thinking about that because I know that when I've been thinking about how I felt and my thoughts like posting the movie, one of the things I was thinking is like, all right, this, A, I'm hoping that it makes all the money in the world so that studio execs can stop using that excuse that, you know, films not led by people of color and women of color and women are not financially and critically viable because they are and I even mean, internationally. Fast and Furious is a billion dollar franchise, yeah. so they know better. They just, a girl's trip made over a hundred million dollars. And they, get out. Yeah, they see, people see what they want to see. Yeah, so um, I want to talk a bit about your new comic book that you have coming out. Let's yeah. do a really yeah. like choppy, messy segue into that. Sure. <laughs> hey there. <laughs> just jump all over the place. But I mean, we were talking earlier about comic books and trades, and you mentioned that this one is being released all six at the same time. So tell me a little bit about that book. Yeah, I'm doing a comic book series called The Banks for a new comic company called TKO Studios. and. It's going to be a six episode series about three generations of black women who are master thieves in Chicago. And I don't know what they're going to do yet, but they're going to get up to something. <laughs> they're going to get up to some trouble. It's going to be awesome. So did writing World of Wakanda and working on World of Wakanda, which is the first time you wrote a comic book, did that make you want to explore the medium a little bit more? Yeah, definitely. It's different and it's more collaborative than most of my work and so it's really interesting and it was interesting because around the same time I was also writing a screenplay and I'm working on a TV show and there is actually I find more overlap between comics and film and television than comics and like nonfiction or fiction and so it's been really interesting and um, it's like cross training for the mind. <laughs> I like it. It's a lot yeah, of fun. I mean, comics are basically storyboarding. Yes, it, so. absolutely. And yeah. so I'm doing that, and I'm actually in discussions now with Boom Studios to do something as well. So I know with your, not with your books, you made a decision to pull from the publisher, and you it was a decision that you were able to make because of the fact that you were already a successful author. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that with comics, you want to focus on working with more of these like indie publishers more or no, I go no. where I I have a hundred and sixty thousand dollars in student loans so I will work for the <laughs> Whoever's highest gonna pay me. <laughs> right no really honestly yeah. I mean I pay a thousand dollars a month and it doesn't even cover the interest so I'm gonna be spending the rest of my life paying off these loans. Hot life of a writer. 
That's so great. <laughs> <laughs> the best. <laughs> um, so we're going to jump back to World of Wakanda. And we were talking a little bit earlier before we started filming about how the way that series was marketed, which tends to be a little bit of a theme when it comes to um, titles that are written by or feature LBG LBGTQ characters or people of color or women or women of color, they don't, they're not hitting the mark that they need to be hitting. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that Marvel has a very good marketing team and that team is very good at marketing to its core demographic. They do not really know how to market beyond their core demographic, and they don't know how to educate the market about where to go and how to navigate a comic store. When I got the contract to write World of Wakanda, I went to a comic store, and it was really overwhelming. It's organized unlike a bookstore, and it's organized by week, and then alphabetically, and then back issues are in an entirely different place. And not every comic book store is the same. I've been to three different comic book stores with three different setups and so I you know when I would go in there looking for a specific comic it was really overwhelming and oftentimes I did not find the staff at the comic book stores overly interested in helping and that's okay I mean it because I have a brain I figured it out but you know if you don't even know where these stores are and how to navigate them it's really hard to get these products and in the hands of like the people I think of as my core audience and so um, I had a really good publicist, and World of Wakanda, I think, got a lot of media attention. It did. Um, but I think that there was a gap between, okay, what do we do now that we know this comic exists? And um, that was frustrating. So outside of the comic book you're working on right now, what are some other genre like, would you want to get more involved in genre and do more stuff in the science fiction and fantasy realm? Yeah, I'm in the very early stages of um, working on adapting a short story of mine called We Are the Sacrifice of Darkness about a man who works in, my, in these mines in this um, sort of near-earth place and he gets so tired of the darkness that he flies an air machine into the sun and the world becomes shrouded in darkness and it's about his legacy and how his son has to pay the price for the sins of the father. And so I'm um, going to be turning that into a graphic novel. Oh. Well, Sounds and I'm not writing it, but um, <laughs> I am going to sort of spearhead it. And um, my a very dear friend of mine is actually going to be doing the writing. Oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Is that the thing that you might be doing with Boom? Or? Yeah. Wow. So we, we haven't contracted it yet, but... So you're not allowed to be saying this? <laughs> no, I, can, I, I don't think it's a trade secret. Okay. Um, Outside of... Black Panther, what are some other movies that are coming up that you're looking forward to that are within the science fiction and fantasy uh, Anything that The Rock is in? <laughs> so, <Anything>. Rampage? <laughs> it's gonna be so good. Skyscraper is gonna be such a shit show. <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> the Rock is gonna jump from a crane to a building? Okay, I'm in. You're it doesn't matter what Dwayne is in. I'm interested in his movies. Um, What are some other movies that are you excited for? Are you excited for A Wrinkle in Time? Yeah, I'm going to the premiere. Are you? I am. Did you Ava read the book? Invited me. When I was a kid. I don't, but the thing is, I don't remember it. I'm excited for it because it looks gorgeous. And I think it's going to be really good. Yeah. And I remember the book being good, but I don't have like these rapturous memories that everyone seems to be sharing right I now. I never read the book. I'm actually going to read it before it comes out because I want to. I have to remind myself. I don't even remember what it's about, to be honest. Yeah. I'm old. But it does. It looks beautiful. It does. I think it's going to be really good. And she's also another person that's such a great filmmaker that mm -hmm. I feel like deserves more due than she gets. Yeah, and I, I think that with this movie she's going to get yeah. a lot of that due. I hope so. I hope people are as supportive of this movie as they are of um, Black Panther. And so actually what I'm going to do is I'm buying out a theater so that some girls, I don't even know, I don't even know how I'm going to do it. Oh my god, wait, time, but, I will help yeah. you with this. I'm going to tell you how to do this. Okay. Okay, because I, we did this for Wonder Woman. We, um, I started a group called Legion of Women Writers. It's just like a female networking group. And we decided to raise money to rent a theater to send girls to see Wonder Woman. So we linked up with Girls Inc. And we actually raised enough money to bring a group of girls from Girls Inc. to pay for them to go to the movie theater and see Wonder Woman, but then we also raised enough money to go towards their annual college showers. We raised like $10,000 for that. That's them. awesome. So 
that's a really good group to do with it. And there's also like a, fe a girls writing group in LA. I forget what they're called. But, um, and the majority of the girls that are in these programs come from like underserved neighborhoods. So like, they might not ever have the money to go do a lot of this Those stuff. Those are expensive. They're I'll really tell you what, expensive. it was twenty one fifty a ticket. Yeah. And I was just like, that's not even in like Indiana, the we pay $8. Yeah. So I, I just looked at the ticket and I was like. The <laughs> Girls, Inc. Is, <laughs> Girls Inc. is out here. And then I'll find the name of that Girls Writers Group. But cool, because I was like, yeah, I'm going to just buy out a theater. And then like I thought, maybe I'll just give these tickets away on Twitter. But because I, I want, this movie deserves all the love yeah. in the world. I want to talk about your short story that you wrote, There's No E in Zombie. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people don't know the origin of a zombie. And this story definitely uses that origin. Like yes. That's how you tell the story of a zombie. So for people that don't know, do you want to give them a little bit of a background of how zombie actually, right? Yeah, zombie. zombie. Yeah. Yeah, so zombies are real. Hmm. And so I wrote this zombie story once because I actually find most zombie stories to be unbearable. And I was talking to my mom, who's from Haiti, and uh, she is a strict Catholic and really grounded in reality. And one day we were talking and she was like, oh, the zombies are real. And I was like, mom, you surely do not believe in zombies. And she explained to me that zombies are real. And I was like, huh. And she said, oh, it's something that happens in the countryside. And I was like, oh, OK. So whenever something happens that she doesn't know about or that she doesn't agree with, it happens in the countryside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I went about my business. And a few weeks later, I saw a documentary. And I think it was from Vice about this phenomenon. And it turns out zombies are actually real. It's um, there's this powder that comes from the cheek of a puffer fish, and it puts people into a near-death state where they're very susceptible to being told what to do. And um, in the countryside, true story. <laughs> so your mom was not making this up. She, this time it was true. <laughs> uh, people will kidnap people and give them this powder and use them as free labor because they can't afford labor for their farms. And there are, I'm sure there are other uses. And I was like, holy cow, what would I do if I could like make someone do whatever I wanted them to do? And uh, that's how that story came about. I think one of the things that stood out to me too is that knowing the background of where the word zombie came from, and it, it's, you never see that in modern day zombie stories ever. Yeah, in modern day zombie stories, it's all about flesh and yeah. flesh eaters and you know the undead. And it, you can see how they got there yeah. from what zombies actually are. But it's it's interesting to see like what the popular imagination has done with the zombie story and The Walking Dead and all those other zombie stories. Would you ever want to adapt that short story into something more flushed out or longer? <sighs> I mean, I could see doing making that into like a movie, sure. But I don't think I would like make it into a novel. I think that, you know, sometimes th there's more, but for that story, I'm actually really happy with where it is. I really liked it. Thanks. I really liked how I you liked described it too. Um, when they first were getting together. Yeah. That whole paragraph is like, it wasn't obvious. It was like so well written, but it was like so sexy. Like I felt myself getting a little like, oh my God, this is hot. That's what I do. Go on. You're like, I'm a writer. Did you hear? <laughs> I mean, uh, me and like, words. Tell me more about me. It's just me and words. <laughs>